Hi everybody, I'm Hayden Crawford. And I'm Shani Faye Chambers. And welcome to Wellness Uncut. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so good to have you back here, Shani. Oh, do you know what? I love so good to be back. I love our filming days. Mm. I absolutely do. You're a joy for me to be around oh. and you always bring in such beautiful energy with you. Ah, thank you. Yeah, which is actually isn't what we've been experiencing today, is it? It's been like full on. <laughs> it's the topic. It is the topic. What is today's trending topic? So usually we just cover a trending topic for about, you know, maybe 10 minutes or something. But we've realised that this is huge and just everything that's come up around it since we've decided <laughs> to do it. So the whole segment, pretty much, we are exploring narcissism and narcissistic tendencies, narcissistic traits. Um, how to navigate your way through narcissistic relationships. We'll be calling a dilemma for um, how to navigate narcissism within families and kind of really cracking the lid open a little bit on that subject because it's huge, isn't it? It is huge and it's such a, it, it's kind of like something that's totally misunderstood as well, the whole notion of, mm. of narcissism. And, you know, we want to try and clear up some of those 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 kind of like misrepresentations of of this alleged you know sort of disorder. Yeah, but at the same time, it's I feel it's really important that we do have the information out there because I know that when I went through my first narcissistic relationship in my early twenties, I had no idea what was going on and all the gaslighting, all the manipulation, all the blame, all the lack of responsibility on his part. All that stuff I didn't understand and I was constantly, you know, what's the word, is it calibrating myself around his behaviour rather than just being, hang on a minute, that's not okay. And, you know, since, you know, the age of Facebook and stuff like that, we have so many articles out there about narcissism that I really wish that was around in my 20s. I would have saved myself years of pain. Absolutely. Maybe I wouldn't have, but who knows? <laughs> yeah, you probably would have still gone through the same stuff, but you would have just been aware of it. <laughs> yeah, I would have been like, oh, that's what's going on. Oh, maybe I should stop that. A year later going, yeah, it's still happening now. <laughs> but we're also going to be speaking to Annie Mae from Alchemy Body and Soul, who's uh, who's written a beautiful new book called You Got This, and, and actually asking her opinion on narcissism as well. So the, the main feature of today actually is going to be focused around this because it is such a broad topic. So I'm so excited to get started. Mm. But first of all, I think what we should look at is you know what we have been kind of told are the traits of a narcissist because obviously you know we all think it's it's one thing but actually you know it's a oh is that yours <laughs> oh there it is okay so we want to just go through these quickly don't we shiny so yeah. the first one the first trait is instantly likable okay so uh, like i know i am <laughs> and you certainly I are Surely I'm likeable, so does that make me a narcissist? Well... I've got you, the number one trait. You've got the number one trait, mm. absolutely. What about dominate conversations? <laughs> mm -hmm. We just created our own chat show so that nobody could interrupt us, so... Oh, that's two out of two. What else have we got? <laughs> okay, do you have a fear that you're not good enough inside? Uh, yeah, that's, that was huge. I've done a lot of work around that, but I think kind of everybody does. Don't they? Well, I don't know about everybody else, but I know I do. Mm. So, you know, number two, Three definitely. Of, oh, no, that's, oh, that's still the second one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Assume leadership. <laughs> Assume leadership, yeah. Trying to, at least. Leading anyway. in the field. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, that that's that's a big one, really. Shy and withdrawn. Mm. Yeah, I very much can be. Hugely. <laughs> and do you inwardly, inwardly resent other people from time to time? Oh uh, yeah, I will. But then I'll <laughs> then I'll have a look at myself and be like, well, what have you done to create that? So, okay, but yeah, I do. <laughs> That's the next one: social climbing and promoting themselves. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Well, a little bit. Outer image rules. Well, you've got your own dress label. Oh you? yeah, of course. And your hair's always so beautifully <laughs> fluffed as well. Yeah. Detesting criticism and being hypersensitive. I'm definitely very hypersensitive. Um, I don't like people not liking me, so receiving criticism, I really don't like it. But I do love it because you know it's I take criticism when it's when it's been given 
you know, with the best intentions. Constructively. Constructively. But I don't like it. I don't think anyone does. No do way. You? I hate it. No, it puts me off people straight away if they criticise me. So don't do it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and then disastrous past, yes. Disastrous past, Shani. Guilty. Yeah. Guilty as, uh, as, as accused. And then taking everything personally. What do you mean it's not always about us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I take things personally way too often. Um, mm -hmm. Learning not to. Learning not to. And then addictive behaviour. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. And, and that can be like anything from like sugar, alcohol, people, you know, work. places, work. Absolutely anything. All of those. So <laughs> if we were going to go by just those 10 traits that, are, you know, you can just basically get a list Google. of this off Google, you know, and, and, and you, would, you would think that you were a narcissist, wouldn't you? Well, I mean, according to this, I am. and We got 10 out of 10. Woo! But is this really narcissism? Is it? What do you think it is, Shani? Well, you know, at the end of the day, I think we need to accept the fact that we all have narcissistic tendencies, but there's a, there is a psychological disorder that you can be diagnosed with, and true narcissism is the inability to be able to display empathy, so you can't put yourself in someone else's shoes. And it's a complete lack of responsibility for what's going on in your life. <clears throat> so the narcissist will show up in one of two ways. They will show up as the hero or the victim, but never the perpetrator. And the thing is, is that we are all the things. You know, we are the victim, we are the perpetrator. We, we, we can come in and be the hero as well, but... You know, we have to be able to really own our shadow and it's the, it, it, it goes a lot deeper with narcissism, but they, they can't own their shadow. And so they project it out onto everybody around them, which makes it really, really hard to deal with. And we have to sort of confess that like we aren't the experts, are we, on no. narcissism? So, you know, if you want to find out more about it, then go and see, mm -hmm. I don't know, like a, a, a psychotherapist or a shrink or a doctor, yeah. I guess. But, but you know, we, we've had our own experiences along the way. And this is kind of like how, how like we are interpret, uh, interpreting it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just trying to get that word out there. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, I think that for me personally, I mean, I've been in uh, relationships that I have called narcissistic in the past. But now that I've learned more about it, I actually feel like it's they, they just demonstrate traits of just being too into themselves and not thinking about me as, as much as I'd like them to. And actually, you know, that whole role that I fell into, having a narcissistic relationship, you know, I, I very much played the role of the victim. But I, I definitely drew drew some sort of strength from that. So I really had to question what it is that I was accepting as, you know, the behaviour that I was willing to allow into a, into a dynamic like that. And I really love how you said play the role of the victim because, you know, it is, it is a role that we're playing in relationships and it is what are we attracting and why are we attracting it because we can actually become narcissistic in our own blame of all the narcissists, you know, because we're not taking responsibility either and we're not, you know, having a look at what it is that we're doing to create that. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot of information out there about the attraction between an empath and a narcissist. And what actually is really going on over there is that, you know, we're, we're trying to learn lessons. That's why we attract the mirror of what it is that we kind of need to learn. So if you are too far one way, too far into empathy, then you will attract a narcissist to balance you out. It is the polarization of that lesson that you need to learn. Whereas if you could learn the healthy balance between selflessness and selfishness, and actually having that strong boundary and honour within yourself that would make you a bit more whole and complete, then you would be able to attract a whole and complete partner. So to really heal through this, we actually need to have a look at what's going on within us to be attracting that, you know, because it's so quick and easy to blame. And then it just, you know, it's, and <laughs> we had to, we had to do a lot of work on setting the room up for this segment um, because, you know, we're dealing with really painful shadow and really, um, really dark energy because, and it's not, you know, what happens with narcissists, you know, to really cut it down into, into 
what's going on on a deep and deep deep psychological level is that they've got such a such a high level of self-hatred and inability to own their own shadow which we all have that to be able to cope they have created a psychological split and they've created this perfect persona and in creating that perfect persona that's what they demonstrate to the world but this is still very much linked to them and it still has to show up so what they do is they project that out onto everybody else everybody else can see this they can't so we end up having this really and the more that we split off and deny shadow the bigger it gets the more momentum it gets the more energetic attachments it has to it so because we're kind of tapping into that energy today to kind of bring some light to it we've had an interesting morning haven't we we certainly have you know technology seems to be going black on us you know as, yeah, we, as speak. we speak <laughs> so you know we're, we're <laughs> it's just so strange but you know it it, it, it is a scary subject you know and it, it's definitely one that has attracted quite a lot of very unusual people to me along the way as well um so you know i just we want to shine some light into the into this whole you know, illusion really, and 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 help you to to understand it better. Now, what's quite interesting is that when Emma, um, dial Emma, Emma Romano, she um, put a post up on her on her Facebook page uh, yesterday and just asked a few a few questions, see if people have got some interesting viewpoints on narcissism. And and actually, um, the post you know it got a lot of engagement, and a lot of people wow. had loads of questions about it. And we've actually compiled some of those the better the best of those questions to go through with you today because we really want to sort of um you know give you some some really quite deep insights so shani Do you wanna start? yeah i could start if you like so yeah. the first one was was kate actually kate uh Fulu, or Fulos, i think she might be called and she obviously says there is a lot of misunderstandings about narcissism out there. It's a very, very loose term. And, and, and that's why we kind of addressed that right at the beginning, because, you know, it is known as narcissistic personality disorder. So, you know, it's actually a, a, a diagnosis. And she was like, well, you know, not all assholes out there are, are narcissists, so, although we'd like to believe that they are, because when we get hurt, we just want to label people, you know, as being something so that we can kind of pathologize them yeah. and you know um really it is a, a, an actual disorder it's a personality disorder it is diagnosed so try not to to be too flippant around that but she says well what about the victims are they narcissists too and you know i just really think that's a, such a great a great question you know because if you look at the traits of a narcissist you know one of them is that you know they can be quite um passive as well but secretly resent so you know it's it's almost like absolutely the, the victims can mirror the narcissist behavior and you know and, and it was something that you were talking to me about earlier on shani wasn't it when you were saying that you know you um in a in relationships sometimes that you kind of were expecting those behaviors to show up and if they didn't it would make you feel like they didn't care there was almost like that pattern was being emphasized and, 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 and highlighted for you so you can yeah. address it yeah we'll talk about that a little bit more with some of the questions around narcissism and relationships but yeah we really do as a victim if we don't take responsibility for the fact that we have on some level created this relationship then yeah we're just playing straight into that same narcissism ourselves of oh it's everybody else's fault <laughs> so yeah it is it's a, it, it really is and it's I think we've got to look at it more as narcissistic tendencies because we all have them and, and how to really, you know, to counteract that is just to step into radical self-responsibility of going, how am I contributing to this? How can I change this? What work do I need to do? What shadow am I not owning? And how am I, how am I going to work through that? And how can I actually make sure that my actions and the things that I'm doing aren't having a, a negative impact on others because, you know, it's it's that narcissistic, oh, well, this is me, take it or leave it, that's your shit, deal with it. You know, that's, that's not helping either. So it's a case of really looking, everybody looking at themselves through this. All right, thank you so much, Kate, for that question. It was great. Next question from Susie Landers. Hi, Susie. Hi, Susie. We love Susie. Yeah, we do. She's, we spend a lot of time with Susie. She's great. Um, so she's asked, um, are people born 
a narcissist or do people become like that? Such a good question and let's, I want to look at it from a couple of different avenues. Um, I guess with people who've got that very strong borderline, uh, sorry not borderline, the strong narcissistic personality disorder, they are like that and there's not much that you can do to change. So yeah, they are born like that. And they're born like that for a few different reasons. So sometimes, you know, they have come in because, you know, this is not our first rodeo. Our soul has been through many, many, many other lifetimes. And sometimes they have come in with so much pain and so much guilt and shame and self-loathing from what they've done in previous lifetimes that it's already a massive scar and a massive split that they can't look at their own shadow. So in when you're looking at it like that, yeah, they, they, they're, they're born with that pain, they're born with that psychological split. But what also happens is that we, on a deep soul level, because it's through all this pain and trauma and challenge that we learn and we grow and we evolve, we need them. We need them. We need to have those people that are choosing to come in this lifetime and be the perpetrator so that we can learn those lessons. So it's actually all perfect that they are born like that. It is. It's perfect. You know, and when you strip it back to, to that, and it's a hard concept to get your head around, the fact that you would have chosen to have been, like, kicked around by an asshole. <laughs> but, you know, it's it, the way I kind of, like... Um, how I integrated this information really was through the colour mirrors and this bottle in particular helped me understand what it's all about. So this is the evolved sacral chakra colour, so it's called suchness and it's orange on the top which in colour therapy is about shock, abuse and trauma and pink in the subconscious part of the bottle which is about divine love and unconditional love towards the self. So really the bottle is, is recognising, the such, it's called suchness because it's like recognising that the people in your life that you know, don't, don't you construe as being your baddies, actually loved you enough to be able to teach you those lessons that you needed to learn in this lifetime. So, you know, it takes that whole notion of, of you being a victim out of, out of the equation. Yeah, I love that. We're never really the victim unless we choose to be the victim. You know, we're just playing a role where we can learn and grow. And what happens is that we either have these experiences and like, for example, I've been in a few too many of these relationships. Um, they just kept finding me last year because there was a lot of lesson in there for me. It was five, wasn't it? <laughs> you're greedy. I know. You're a, you're a narcissist muncher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that Guilty. <laughs> so, um, and I didn't seek them out either. They all seeked me out they found me on Facebook some I already knew some just infiltrated and wanted to get to know me and very quickly I'm like holy shit like this is another narcissist and it was quite painful for me because I'm like well why am I attracting this and is it them or is it me because I'm the common denominator either right now so I was also looking at it like okay is this just my belief system that I believe that you know, all men are narcissists and therefore I'm attracting them or can I not see clearly because, you know, of my past experience and what's just happened that I'm, I'm projecting that onto someone else. Um, but what happened last year is that I got to really delve quite deeply into healing um, what was going on for me and how I was attracting and I got to really analyse a lot of information about what, what, what was going on and why that was happening. Um, and it was beautiful because each time I had massive opportunity to heal and grow through and become more whole so I could attract something different. And then I could heal and grow through and move on. And now I'm in such an amazing place to be able to attract something very, very, very different. But what happens if we go into the victim mentality of it, of thinking that it's everybody else's fault, we sit with the wounding, we don't heal it, we don't own it, and we don't learn what it was that we did to attract that. So it will happen again, and we'll go deeper into our wound. And we won't own it, and we won't heal it, and we'll attract it again, and go deeper and deeper. 
So it is really about radical self-responsibility, whether you are the narcissist or whether you are the on the other side of the scale with that. Um, Did you find that there was one particular narcissist that you attracted that, that, that you learned deeper lessons from? Yeah, there was one... Um, the first one that I ended up in a relationship with, it was someone that I knew, I thought I knew really, really well. Um, I'd known him for two and a half years. We've been really good friends. Uh, he was meant to be a life coach and personal trainer and he was meant to know all this stuff. Um, but we got into a relationship pretty much overnight from being friends for two and a half years to straight into a relationship, straight to moving in with me um, and straight into a nightmare. And it was just, it was really horrible and it was really painful because I also knew that I had like a lot of pain in my heart and, and stuff around relationships that I knew was going to come up for me the minute I opened my heart. So me taking radical self-responsibility, I was constantly looking, okay, well, this is how he's showing up. What have I done to create this by, you know, my belief systems or you know, my, my perception of what's happening, you know. So, yeah, I that only lasted nine weeks because I was getting healing like every week, shifting and shifting and shifting into a place that I could actually see things clearly. And also I had quite a lot of people coming up to me and saying, Shani, he is not who you think he is. He's just a really good actor. Um, and I found out a lot of really bad stuff. So I got out of that one really quickly. Wow, just um, as well. Yeah, there was some really dangerous stuff that he was doing that I had no idea about as well. Um, so I got out of that really quickly, um, nine weeks, <laughs> and he was living with me too. So is he, was he like diagnosed with uh, with narcissistic personality disorder or was, you know, was where, where did that term come from for him? Well, um, he, no, he, he hasn't been diagnosed with anything. Um, but what was coming, what came up when I did, because I have got the most amazing healer in the world who sees everything and can um, really, really help me a lot through it. I was seeing her, I've been seeing her for years, but she was helping me clear up all the patterns while I was in it so that I could start to see clearly. And then um, once I got out of it, we went to clear all the attachment, all the connections. And this is what's really interesting. And this, you know, kind of just goes back to what I was saying before with the big psychological split, which I've always known about. We did all this work having to clear the connection between us. And then we had to do it with his alter ego as well, because I really was dealing with two different people. So, wow, that sounds so intense. Yeah, it was. It was oh, I feel sick just tuning into the energy of it again. Um, <laughs> so, so, so even though you had worked on yourself, had had he worked on himself as well, or, or not? Well, you know, he's apparently done all the work, but you know, you've got to embody the work. You know, you can't just learn it and preach it. You've actually got to embody it. And I think, you know, in his alter ego he was, but in those other aspects. And um, also, you know, I didn't realise it at the time, but there was a lot of heavy drugs involved that he was taking that I didn't know about. And I think that really changes people as well. So It changes the whole dynamic of it, it when, really the, when the drugs are in, yeah. involved. But again, that's um, that's a trait of the addictive personality that comes up with mm. with the narcissist as well. So, do you, do you feel like you've moved on from from that? Oh god, yeah, yeah. I um, I was really dark for a while. I had to like not work and stuff because it was really painful that I had experienced that. And how could I have attracted that back into my life again? You know, and um, yeah. So it took a couple of months to after breaking it off to really heal deeply through that and you know then I was back doing my thing feeling really good and then another one comes in and um this was really interesting because there was a part of me that's sitting there going I'm because I've known this guy for over a year he'd been trying for over a year and I'd been like mm, no nah, no nah, because I knew that he was not really that good of a person but for some reason uh I had to go step into that again to discover what was going on and it was really interesting the stuff that I learnt in that you know I was doing a little bit more research and I learned some really important tools about dealing with narcissists um, that I then applied 
and because I, I'm sitting in this whole space of is he a narcissist or am I just believing that everyone's a bloody narcissist you know so um, I actually applied some of these these rules that I learned that and one of them is narcissists will not respect your boundaries um, especially with time so and this this is a big one that you know, narcissists really love bomb you to begin with because, you know, they put you up on a pedestal, they tell you how wonderful you are and they want to, because because of their own self-loathing and their own pain, they have massive attachment issues. So they will attach really quickly. And because of my own abandonment issues, I was just, I was just sucking right up into that because it's like these guys would just come in, they would love bomb me, they would tell me that they wanted me to be their girlfriend very quickly so they would offer me all this security and you know for for someone with my wounding that was like oh yeah please you know? <laughs> yes please <laughs> yes please you know just wrap me up and tell me everything's gonna be okay <laughs> um you know so I, I was like shit this is why I keep on falling into this trap you know and but this time because I had that awareness that shit Shani I think you're getting into another narcissistic relationship here you know you know he was trying to you know fly me over to meet his mum and you know we might have known each other for a year but we spent one night together must have been a good night. Um, must have been. <laughs> but he's like trying to move it along that quickly and the intuition's going, this isn't good. So, you know, when I learned that they don't respect time boundaries and I tried to slow it down, he was, he went off and he was not happy. And then I explained to him, it's like, look, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a bit of fear. Like this is, this is quite scary for me, you know. Entering into any new relationship with my history is scary, let alone tr trying to do it that quickly. Um, and as soon as I went in to explain to him that I was feeling fear, he just verbally attacked me even more. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, if you can't display empathy for where I'm at and, you know, understand that, hey, look, I've got a bit of a history and, and that I just need things to slow down a bit, then, and then he straight away was like, I've got plenty of empathy for you and then attacked me again. And I'm like, okay, this confirms it. So, yeah, I, that was really valuable information for me. Um, to to recognize how quickly they try to move things along, how quickly they try to secure you, and when you try to slow them down or you know show some boundaries that they they don't like it, and so they go into their own defense and attack because their ego can't handle it. Yeah, so they start throwing their dummies out the pram. Mm. It's like, oh, I want her now. <laughs> You know, and it is childlike behaviour in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah. So what would your advice be then to anybody who finds themselves in a toxic, you know, union like that? Wow. Um, get some healing, get some, you know, get some distance, get some space. Um, because, you know, I couldn't see it. When you're in it, because of the manipulation, whereas, you know, I've done a lot of work to kind of clear what was allowing me to be manipulated to the extent that I was... Once you kind of step away from it and see it from an outside perspective, then you're able to go, wow, this is really not healthy. So, you know, it, it can take a lot of healing. And especially, you know, if this is if this is your first time in one of these relationships and you don't recognize the patterns and you need to you need to get a lot of awareness about what these patterns are. And if you've been in them a few times, then you really need to do a lot of work to go, what is attracting these? You know, so I had to really sit with, well, what is it that I'm attracted to in these relationships? And it was the security that they were offering me to begin with, you know. Okay. Massively. Yeah. So it goes back to survival, yeah? Yeah. 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 And it's interesting because now I'm seeing things on the other scale of things and, you know, I'm seeing a really beautiful, genuine, sweet man that's definitely not a narcissist and because he doesn't have that same attachment style and he's quite casual and, you know, I'm not hearing from him a thousand times a day and he's not trying to move things really quickly. It's just nice and casual and what we would define as healthy. <laughs> I'm freaking out and being like, oh, my God, he doesn't like me. Oh, I better, I better shut this down, <laughs> you know, rather than being like, Hang on a minute. This is this is normal behaviour. This is actually healthy behaviour. So, you know, and that actually goes into that a, a question that um, Lynn Powell asked. She said, "If it feels like love, it looks like love. How to recognise a narcissist that you believe that you love?" The thing is, is that if you've had these kinds of relationships, and that's kind of what 
you have associated love to feel like and to look like and to be like and you spend so much time kind of calibrating your behavior around a narcissist that you have learned some really really unhealthy patterns so yeah if it looks like love and feels like love honey you need to think about what do you think love is and what have you experienced love to be like in the past because you'll probably just walk straight back into the, that same trap so one thing that you know as, as I was going through this um, last year I was having a lot of clients going through the same thing and so it's very easy to kind of give that advice when you've just been through it and being like this is what I wish I'd done differently document everything write it down what came up for you what happened how did you try to explain it and what did they say because you don't realize all the gaslighting and manipulation that goes down until you actually go back and be like oh and this and and this and and, and this document it actually write it down because that's when you've actually got in black and white what's actually gone down was the otherwise you just feel like you're going in insane don't you oh yeah because uh, really do well I and mean, it happens to me like there's probably been th probably three or four actually that i've had before i met my husband um so um, when i was 30 i met my husband but up until that point it was disaster zone for me with relationships and um you know, probably the worst one was when I was working as a holiday rep over in um, Halkidiki um, in Greece. And I met somebody and, you know, got all the love bombing thing very quickly. He told me that he loved me. And I was deeply insecure as well because I would, you know, I, I'd, I'd become a holiday rep after leaving Australia. And I didn't want to stay in the UK. So I was kind of just trying to fill time in until I could get back to Australia. And, you know, I, was, I didn't know where I was supposed to be in the world. So when he showed up and he started telling me, how much he loved me and all of that. I just wanted to hang on his every word because it made me feel like I had somewhere to be and that I, I belonged somewhere. And he must have seen my vulnerability. You know, he must have done because, like, it wasn't the only thing that was going on at that time. There was a lot of negative stuff around me. But, you know, it actually culminated in physical violence. You know, and I'd never been involved in any sort of physical violence ever before. Um, you know, emotional abuse or mental abuse and all of that yeah right, you know i've grown quite accustomed to deal with that but not physical and it was one night we were out and and he we were sitting at the front of a coach actually we were guiding a tour and uh, it was an, a, like a, a pub crawl so it was a late night one and he just grabbed me by the throat and he went Boom, like that and i got this big gouge in my in my in my throat and i was just like it felt like somebody else's life like it wasn't really a, it wasn't really my Thing that was happening and I couldn't understand why I'd allowed it to get to, to how it had but he'd broken me down so gently well not gently but like slowly over a period of time that I hadn't even realized I'd lost all of my confidence and that I was just almost accepting the fact that that was kind of normal and then a few weeks later I was at the top of the stairs in his apartment and he um, and I can just remember standing there and he was there, we were getting into this argument and I almost had to wake myself up out of that scene because I could almost see myself being thrown down the staircase and I had to kind of like wake up and go, what are you creating in this scenario? It was almost like I was contributing to that scene, like I was almost wanting him to do it, maybe to get me out of that dynamic, I don't know, but... It was like it was pretty scary because it, it was at that point I realised that I was co-creating that whole situation and and really it wasn't the blame passed on to him it was it was partly me wanting to be punished um, for some reason and it could have been those you know all of that stuff that I've come I came in with a lot of guilt a lot of shame a lot of blame persecution I know you know now from doing work with you that I'd had um, some quite you know sort of intense past lives where I'd, you know, been quite nasty with, with, with people, you know, so maybe I came in with all of this desire to be abused or punished or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it got really, really bad. So it's a horrible, horrible sort of situation. You don't even realize you're in it sometimes until it's too late, but, but, but you've just got to trust your gut. And if you're feeling like you're, you, you know, your intuition is telling you to get out, just do it. Um, because they certainly won't want to let you go. No. 
leaving a narcissist is the hardest thing you'll ever do, you know, so you've just, you've really got to cut all ties, you've really just got to block them every way, place and form. You might even need to get some heavies to tell them to stay the fuck away, it's, it's hard, it's really hard, because their ego does not want to let you go, not at all, not at all, because if you walk away then, you know, that's just, that plays into their old shadow of self-loathing and they cannot handle that you know they'll do anything to make sure you're not playing into what they don't want to look at so yeah but I really loved how you said the the co-creating and what you're kind of going into in that relationship and that real low toxic behavior low vibrational behavior because the thing is is that we can't show up in a beautiful healthy loving way with a toxic partner. We can't. No. We have to play on their level, otherwise the relationship doesn't work. So it really can bring out the absolute worst in us, where we're actually looking at them just going, well, how am I How am I doing this? This isn't who I am. So it is really a case of, of radical ownership of what's going on for us and, you know, why are we sitting in that and why are we allowing that and kind of taking ourselves outside of it a little bit and seeing the bigger picture of what's really going on. Yeah. Now, Bistra Dean, okay, so she said, um, you know, can can narcissists be helped to mellow their ego, all right? And is their behaviour a camouflage? You know, have they been hurt in the past? And I think that that's the key to it, really, because... You know, of course they have. They're, they're so hurt themselves that they just want to they want to project that hurt onto onto to you. And, you know, it's not that they don't love you initially because I think that they have feelings or they, you know, you, you bring some sort of light into their life, but then they don't like that light and they want to they snuff it out. So, you know, they've been hurt usually, you know, and it could be numerous different things that would, would have hurt them. Mm. But if they're not willing to take responsibility for their own pain, then you, you can't really help them. They can't, they can't, we can't heal anyone that is not ready to heal. Like, it doesn't matter how many sessions you have with how many different people, the best in the business, it comes down to self responsibility. And if someone's not ready to be responsible for the part that they play in something, then no, you can't heal them. And, you know, that is the crux of what's going on for the narcissist is that they believe it's not them. They believe it's everybody else. So it's like working working with an ego that isn't willing to look at itself is very, very difficult. Mm. So, yeah, I think it really just comes down to rather than trying to heal everybody else, let's just focus on healing ourselves. And if we're coming from a very whole and healed place, then we're going to show up differently. Absolutely. And if we show up differently, we're going to attract something different. That's right. We, uh, we've got another question about narcissism, haven't we, for, uh, for Emma Romano. Um, and it's, a, it's more around um, narcissism within the family dynamics. Yeah, so definitely. we are going to... Dial Emma! Hey guys, it's Emma Romano here. I'm so glad you dialed Emma. So it's a massive topic about narcissism. And what I love honing in about is how to help you as a mother or a father um, with children whose ex is a narcissist. And what happens, you can't come away from that narcissistic behavior. You're stuck with it. But there are a couple of things you need to know. So I know Hayden and, and Shani have already talked to you about the traits of a narcissist. They're always the victim or they're always a superhero, but they are never, ever, ever the villain. They're never the one who's done anything wrong. But somebody who's been with an ex, um, with a narcissist and you've got the kids and you're sharing, for some reason, that person will keep playing into forcing that narcissist to be more in their victim or more in their hero. So I'm gonna give you some really top, top pointers. And you're gonna hate it, but if you want an easier life, you have to play a bit of a game. So what I do is what I tell my clients is, what's better? Is it having peace with your kids and him or trying to win an argument that you will never, ever, ever win? Because a narcissist is never the villain. You gotta remember this, all right? They're never wrong. So one of the greatest things, narcissists are actually rather 
great parents because they need to be needed as well. They need to look like a hero in front of other people and they will show their children off. So one of the greatest things you can do is this, feed into their ego. Because they come from massive, massive wounding, they have massive wound and they have a massive ego too. You feed into the wound, you'll get, you'll get World War III on your hands. You feed into the ego, you'll have a very peaceful life. So for instance, I'll give you an example. If you've got the kids and you want uh, the ex to look after the child for an extra night or the kids an extra night, but he's a narcissist like, oh, you're an idiot mother or father, whatever it might be, this is what you do. Do you know what? When you look after, we'll call the kid, kid Bob. When you look after Bob, Bob always comes home so happy. I love that. Hey, listen, you know, you don't want to just uh, look after Bob on Saturday night because I can't wait for him to come home and tell me how amazing his weekend has been with you. Now, that might hurt. That might really hurt. But you've got to ask yourself your bigger why. Because for me, my children mean more to me than me winning an argument with an ex who's a narcissist. Get me? You're never going to win it. So why sit there in this victim, angry, angry mode? Because it's literally like banging your head against a brick wall. Feed into their ego. Tell them how amazing they are. Never put yourself down around them, no. Never say you're a better parent than me. You're better. No, 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 no. You're a great parent. You're a good parent. Thank you for being a good parent. You'll literally floor them and they'll just, they'll be like, oh my God. Because you're talking their language. They don't speak your language. They will never take responsibility for what they have done wrong. Does that make sense? Perfect. I love yeah. it. Wow, I didn't realize that actually. How good is Emma? Oh, she's amazing. Uh, Every time she nails it, doesn't she? She really does. <laughs> um, I get to fly over tomorrow to Melbourne to go run a retreat with her. So you go tomorrow? I, yeah, I'm going oh, tomorrow. God, I, know. I know. Tomorrow morning I fly out, so I'll be over there for like 10 days. Oh, how so. amazing. Mm, excited. I saw that place as well that you're going to be doing your, your next Bali. Oh, the Bali oh, one. Amazing. We, we upgraded to even more amazing accommodation and oh, it just feels so good. Why don't you just... Have you, have you, is that fully booked is that one got two spots left all right okay well, go on tell, tell everyone about it because like it just looks incredible uh okay so me and emma run a five-day practitioner training uh release through wire inspire certification for self-empowerment coaching so i'm about to fly over to melbourne to do it and we also fly over to bali to do it later on in the year we'll have to book another one for later in the year because this one's nearly filled up six months in advance uh, so this will be our third and then our fourth one. So we train practitioners in the four dynamics of healing, which is your conscious mind, that like you need to consciously be able to understand and examine why we do the things that we do. The unconscious mind, which is where all the programs and patterns are held. So we teach you how to get in there and change the programs and patterns. Energy healing, because everything is energy. So we have to shift the energy as well. And soul level healing, because... This is not our first rodeo. You can't just heal this lifetime. We have to go in and, and heal that. So we, we step into a bit of that as well. So we teach over 30 processes that you can then take your clients through. Um, we've had a, both beginners and very, very, very experienced, yeah, experienced practitioners do the training um, because what me and Emma do is very different to what anyone else does. More than 80% of it is original content. Um, so whether you are brand new, then don't worry. We explain things very, very, very well. We're very good teachers and we, we have very small groups to make sure everybody gets it. Or if you're a very experienced practitioner, we, we're still going to teach you some stuff that you would, would not know and have never seen before because it's original and we, we create processes that combine, combine those different levels of healing. So Yes. And so if someone wants to get involved in that, then what, how do they how do they get the last uh, Reach tickets? out, um, send us a message via Facebook or um, however else via our website. Um, get, it, get in contact. We'll have a chat with you first. We need to make sure that we are the right fit for you and that you're the right fit for the group. Um, and we'll just have a chat, make sure we're on the same wavelength and um, go from there. 
get in quick. Yeah. Two places left. Hugely transformational yeah. because we don't just teach you how to do these things and you take each other through it. We also process the crap out of you. So we are each day really watching every person, seeing what's going on for them and taking them through processes in the moment, um, stuff that's not in the manual. So you'll actually, if you actually write down a lot of the stuff that we do, you'll actually realize that there's a lot more than 30 processes. So wow. yeah, very transformational. And also then you can walk away with the tools to help your loved ones, your clients, your friends, your family. Yeah. And your narcissistic partner. <laughs> no, don't help them. Get away from them. <laughs> no, you know, I, I got really stuck in trying to help mine. Um, and that's, you know, that's one thing that I was just so grateful for. And one thing I was so proud of this year or last year, even though it just kept on showing up, is that I showed up very differently each time. So my very first one when I was in my 20s, I stayed in that for years. And then last year I had like five guys show up and the first one that I actually ended up in a relationship for, with for nine weeks, um, that completely blindsided me. So there was no way that I could tell, none of us could tell because we had all seen his alter ego. It wasn't until his shadow side arose that everybody else could see it too. And funnily enough, like even, even the most amazing psychics and intuitives and healers around me didn't see it either because we weren't meant to see it mm. because I was meant to go through that process. Yeah, because I even remember that, like, mm. it came up through yeah. something that I said. Yeah. And I definitely didn't pick up on that. No. Nah. And it actually neither did the cards I was using, so. No. Hmm, don't no. trust Doreen Virtue's oracle <laughs> cards. <laughs> no, and it's, it's that whole thing is that we are not meant to see mm. what we're not meant to see, you know. And so in that whole process, even Emma is brilliant like she's straight on the money with everyone she didn't see it either it wasn't until um her son jack saw a photo of him and he went who the fuck is that she's like that's shiny's new boyfriend he goes he is not a good dude she's like what do you mean yes he is and this was just before he had actually started showing his true character and then not long later, I'm on the phone going, Emma, I don't know what the hell is going on. And then she started seeing it too, intuitively seeing it. So it really was such a split of personality disorder, you know, which can, can be a lot of not. And that's actually one of the questions someone asked us. We didn't really want to go into it because we're not experts, you know, but how does, you know, other things like, like personality disorder of bipolar and schizophrenia aut yeah, autism autism like how does all that play into narcissism and you know what it, it is it just it comes down to the wounding and it comes down to the inability to see outside of ourselves and you know when we are wounded we can't see what's going on for other people you know people who've got you know their brain wired differently they can't see what's going on for people they're just stuck in their pain so you know, a lot of narcissistic tendencies do show up in lots of those different, different things. Um, but yeah, I think we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> Where was I? Well, you were just about to go into the, the final question that yeah, we, that we, we had doing. today. Mm, this is a good one uh, by Rita Joanne. She said, how can one trust another soul again in regards to a relationship? So having been through so much trauma with narcissists how can one step into a new relationship with trust passing that one over to you Hayden because <laughs> you've done it <laughs> I have and you know what it was probably one of the hardest things that I ever had to do because when I met my husband uh, I was in Madeira and you know I didn't even have any feelings at all towards him when I first met him because I was cl closed down because I'd just come from Greece i had been really really badly hurt and it was the last thing that I wanted. So, you know, when, I, when you know, Mark started showing me affection, I, I was just turning my back to it. I didn't, I didn't want to know. So it took a long, long time. And he had to be very, very patient with me um, before I started opening up to that prospect again. And it was literally, I had to just examine his behavior and see if his actions mimicked his words. And every time that I was feeling vulnerable, you know, he overcame that every single time without fail. And... It, I just, the, the red flags weren't, weren't there. You know, the alarm bells weren't going off. It, I felt secure opening up. I was understood 
more than anything that was the most important thing to me that I, I finally felt understood and I finally yeah I, I fully opened my heart and it was during the time actually that I was doing on my Reiki training yeah. and um, during that process we were in Benel Madonna with our Reiki master Julia Rock and she was getting marked to open my heart through using Reiki and I actually one day I remember feeling it kind of blossoming like a big rose in the center of my chest sort of expanding and I knew something had shifted and I was then able to just allow you know in this this really healthy relationship and it's you know fortunately I, we've been together now for like 27 years yeah. and you know there is hope at the at, on the other side really there is you know you, you just have to you might not necessarily go from narcissist to narcissist, you know, and I didn't necessarily feel like I'd done healing in between. Yeah. Um, all I had done, though, was stand up for myself and go, this is not acceptable. I'm not prepared to, you know, to sort of continue with the previous relationship with, with the person who caused me all that grief. And I think probably it was in that, that decision, in me taking a stand and saying, I'm worth more than this, that that could have changed the whole point of attraction. I'm not sure. Mm, that's beautiful. You said some really, really good valid points in that. And, you know, one of the biggest ones was like straight in the feels. It's like each time you felt vulnerable, he kind of really came and picked up and, and looked after you in that. And one thing I've noticed that when I've felt vulnerable, you know, with the narcissist, it's not safe, you know, and they make it a lot worse, which makes you kind of put your guard up more. Um, and just noticing that those red flags aren't going off, you know, you're seeing all the green flags and seeing something different. Um, but, you know, one thing, it, you know, when it does come to trusting another soul, I think it really does come down to being able to trust yourself, you know, being able to trust that you can get yourself out of it and that you can see what's going on clearly. Um, that one was a big one for me, especially considering because I could just kept on getting them. Obviously, the first one got it like last year. The first one got in for nine weeks. The second one got in for about, I don't know, two weeks. And then the next ones, I was able to just be like, no, no, I see what's going on here. No. Um, so, yeah, like I do trust myself to know the difference. But there was a while there where I couldn't, I couldn't decipher whether I was just going crazy or whether it was. You know, so you've really got to do a lot of healing so that you can get solid within yourself and be able to trust yourself. And then, yeah, it is such a scary process, you know. And one thing that I'm finding, just because I'm just very casually dating a guy now, I don't even know if it's going to go anywhere yet. It's just still very fresh. Um, but that is so much harder um, <laughs> because it's different, you know. It's different to what I'm used to. Like, I know that old pattern you know, I know how to show up in those relationships because I've spent a lot of time having to calibrate myself around those people. Um, I know that my last serious relationship with a good guy um, was 10 years ago. He was a really beautiful man for two and a half years we were together. And that was really hard for me to step into that too because the one before was so toxic that I just kept on wanting to run, you know. And it's one of those things that, you know, when you are safe, you know, that's when a lot of your stuff will come up and you really have to kind of lean into it and really start to analyze like so much little stuff, like in the couple of weeks that I've been seeing this other guy has come up for me, you know, and it's like, it's actually really hard work. <laughs> it's kind of painful because mm -hmm. you've actually got to really examine what's going on for you and actually start to shift through it. But at the same time, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to clear that stuff up and actually start to see things from a different light. And and I think also the knowing that, you know, I have the skills to learn through each relationship, that even if it is damaging mm -hmm. at the end of the day, because I choose to learn through it and heal through mm -hmm. it rather than go back into wounding again and again, that, you know, I can trust the bigger picture. I can really trust the bigger picture. But, yeah, I'm struggling to trust him. You know, he's given me no reason not to, but I keep realising that, you know, it's me not, you know, expecting the worst, basically, is what I'm doing. And it's, you know, it's you have to really self-examine yourself and yeah, start you, to shift that shit. It will be a bit like that at the beginning, but I think the more and more he shows up and supports, 
you when you are feeling vulnerable you, you that will dissipate it, it, mm. it really will yeah um so i you know like sometimes when i think when the fi- the penny finally drops that's the end of it you know you can literally move on and, and go into something that's going to support you for the rest of your life in, instead of repeating the same cycles and for you you know like you, you know you've learned enough about that you know you, you are an expert i mean i know you're saying you're not but but you actually are through experience yeah you know, you, you, you are Shani and so am I because like, you know, I've freaking lived through it as well. And, you know, 30, first 30 years of my life, actually, I've just realized as well, I'm 57 according to the calculations of how long I've been together with Mark. Cause I said 27 years when we got together at 30, that makes me 57. Boy, I look good for 57. <laughs> Don't I look good for 57? We've only been together 17 years. So I'm 47. <laughs> I still don't look a day over <laughs> 30, darling. I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love it. Fantastic. Um, All right, then. Well, but, I... Yeah, I just want to say to Rita, you know, like, go there, do it, try again, because it's not until we really face our fears and really try to put ourselves back out there that we can work out whether we've got more work to do. Like, I've I actually spent, you know, a few years ago, I chose to do a year of celibacy and then I chose to do a second year of celibacy because it was so painful um, trying to date with all my wounding that I needed to t- take a break. But guess what? I didn't learn anything in that time. And as soon as I went back to the dating world, nothing had changed because I wasn't doing the work. I wasn't putting myself in the position to go have I cleared enough? Am I mm-hmm. good to go? You know, so by hiding away and being like, oh, you know, I'm, I, I don't trust, I'm scared, that's not going to help either. Sure, you need to spend some time healing, doing the work, getting yourself back into a good position, but you've got to put yourself back out there because it's the only way that you can either find love or find out what needs to go next. Absolutely. Throw yourself back in at the deep end. So don't allow past hurts to dictate future behaviour. It's it's pointless, you know, because yeah. we're here to learn and grow. That's all you yeah. have to remember. You know, we know that, um, you know, narcissistic behaviour which is really uh, a controlling, silent um, behaviour, personality disorder, they say in some circles, draws an empath to them. So it's often a narcissist and an empath in a relationship that are drawing energy from each other because essentially that's why we're in relationships because we, you know, we're drawn to another person's um, energy and in some, some ways, the old way of thinking was that you complete me and which is so, you know, unattractive in so many ways because we need <laughs> to feel whole before we can go into a relationship. So the, the narcissist and the empath are like, you know, they come together like that because they think they uh, one draws from another. But what we find with narcissistic behaviour is that it is a bit of a silent killer and it does make the empath a victim in, in so many ways and it also twists the mind of the victim because they actually think this is normal uh, and the narcissist who's you know and they say that it's a learned behavior so we've seen one or both parents you know passing that on in a, in a, or, or a caregiver perhaps um, passing on narcissism then means that this person really is actually doesn't have the confidence and they're, they're portraying that they do and they're controlling another to, I think, draw that energy from them and actually boost their own uh, ego because it's a very egotistical behaviour that they're exhibiting and it's so detrimental. And, you know, it's then, you know, long term, I think, it elevates the narcissist to be able to become narcissistic to a broader audience and then the victim often gets medicated or has to help and the conscious creation then helps to, I see a lot of empaths and I go, if you could wave a magic wand, would you be in this relationship? And they go, no, I'm too scared to leave it. So it's about getting back that power and saying, well, these are the tools, you know, and it's about changing your self-belief because in order for us to 
develop and grow as a person, we actually have to increase our own self-belief. Our self-worth is everything. Yeah. And empaths just have that taken away, you know. And the narcissist takes it because they don't have it. So they take it from the empath. So it's this whole kind of contorted uh, relationship that doesn't serve anybody. And it's, <laughs> it's insidious, isn't it? Well, listen, once again, if you want to go on to um, Shani's retreat, remember to get in contact with her after Shah. I'll leave some graphics um, underneath as well so that you, you know exactly how to contact her. And also, you know, just a quick plug as well. I'm doing a numerology course as well on the 9th of February, Sunday the 9th of February in East Fremantle. I've only got two places left. So if you're keen, message me. All right. I might as well do a quick plug too. So Emma and I are running Soul Business Alignment in February, which is the 21st, 22nd and 23rd of Feb. Friday night, all day, Saturday, Sunday. Um, give us a buzz if you want to know more about that. I'm also running the DNA process again, which is for experienced practitioners only. Uh, 7th and 8th of March, no, 6th and 7th of March in Perth and then over in Melbourne on the 17th, 18th and 19th of March. Um, but we've always got lots going on and also offering private sessions as well. So if you feel the call to work with us, then reach out. Definitely have a session with Shani with her ancestral clearing. I had one a couple of weeks ago now and it was incredible. So beautifully guided and I felt instant release. Um, so yeah, so it's absolutely fantastic. And that's clearing sort of ancestral patterns going seven ge generations back and forward. So it was amazing. Um, we've also got just one final plug, <laughs> Soul Nourish. Um, oh, yeah. Mayor, we do still have some... Yeah, a couple of spots have become available. Yeah, we've got a couple of spots available. So please, please contact us if you want to be nurtured through a whole weekend in May in Rockingham at the most beautiful waterfront accommodation then um then get in contact with us and we'll give you all the details two full days with yours truly it's gonna be fun it's gonna be insane <laughs> awesome thank you so much for tuning in everybody and we'd love to hear your feedback so thanks bye, bye for now bye